jumped out of his seat and it's like, they're killing Hitler! <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that was... Welcome to the center of the world, presented by Antoine Lavati. Welcome to the center of the world and uh, today's guest, which is uh, already the previous guest, uh, Kitty Phil. Kitty. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so for you it's like a week, <laughs> but for us it's just like an hour where we had like some good chocolates and stuff <laughs> like that. Had to take a break and watch some TV and have yeah, some food. The IT crowd is always a good idea when you want to make a break. Just to uh, put back in the context that Katie uh, is a movie set designer, mm -hmm. working as a production assistant uh, on several projects. Yes, kind and, of. <laughs> and uh, like the most famous stuff are the Goldbergs. She's a freelancer, so you can travel whenever you want. So you 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 went from uh, production to teaching. <laughs> uh -huh. You still you're still uh, an assistant for now, but it means that you're <laughs> learning the stuff. I was a teaching assistant until I was 28. Practice makes it perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so it's a good school of the, the the job itself. Anyway, now teaching assistant in in Spain, and uh, we were talking in the previous episode about your life and yeah. <laughs> uh, we were talking about how you get in that Spanish project mm -hmm. of being a teaching assistant and uh, n and we were literally finishing the, the episode <laughs> about what's your new lifestyle mm -hmm. in Spain. What is that experience right now that you're living every day? Obviously very different than in LA. Um, so I am living in Madrid in, in the Retiro area, but I work in a town called Pedresuela, which is in the northern part of the Comunidad de Madrid, which is like the province, essentially, or the state of Madrid. So my school is quite far from my house, and so every day... I have about a two-hour commute each direction. So it's like four hours? Mm -hmm. But I only work four hours a day, so I spend the same amount of time at work as I do on the bus. So I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks, a lot of podcasts. So yeah, it's kind of, I get up, I get on my two-hour commute, I end up at the school, and there, I'm, what I do every day is, it's always different, and I've learned... I was expecting, I think in in America there are, there's a, a tendency to kind of idolize Europe in certain ways, and like, I definitely was expecting to be like, oh yeah, Madrid has their, their shit together with their school system so much more than, you know, the US, whatever, <laughs> which is not true at all. <laughs> um, yeah, no. I, they're uh, so disorganized. I, uh, I think that uh, both, both sides are, are their pros, both sides are their con, yeah. but uh, <laughs> there, there, there is no one that is better than the other per se, though I, I, I don't regret to have a European education, mm -hmm. for instance, that, that is my point of view, Yeah. Uh, I don't want to judge too much about the other systems yet, I can understand that, yeah, no, it's, it's no better. It's just very disorganized. So on a on a day to day basis, I never really know what I'm going to be doing at school. Um, I kind of find out as it's happening. But I I work mostly with infantil, so students between three years old and five years old. Um, and then I have some older primary classes as well. And it's a very set schedule. I mean, it's I know exactly when I need to leave the house, and exactly when I'm going to be back in the house every single day which is completely different than working in film, um, which has no semblance of a schedule. And then I have my weekends free from Saturday through Monday, so that's why I'm here right now. Oh. Yeah, which is very nice. That's the the very bare outline of my day-to-day, -day, I guess. <laughs> so it's is, is it like one of your first time in Europe? Yeah, it's my first time like living in Europe or spending any sort of significant time in Europe. It's my third time in Europe ever. I was here when I was 18, I was here last year, and now I'm here again. But the longest I was in Europe previously was three weeks, and now I'm here for six months. 
okay. <laughs> so you're enjoying your your experience so far? Yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's been um, very different than I was expecting in a lot of ways, but I'm I'm really happy to be here. For sure. Okay, so what are the difference from expectation to reality? Um, I think the biggest thing is that I had no idea what to expect and the closest thing that I got to any sort of expectation was just from watching other people's study abroad experiences in college and that's obviously very different because I'm here to work and I have a job and I'm not 19 and <laughs> so you know it's been a lot more you know, actually going to work and being tired from work and managing my money and a lot less, like, a lot less partying, which is not what I, I like to do anyways. But I think in, in that way, it's just a little bit more, it's a little bit more serious. It's a little bit more normal than I was expecting. Like, I'm just really living in Madrid. It's not like it's a Europe trip. It's like, I'm, I'm just there now. <laughs> um, and I think One thing that is very different is kind of my mental state. Like, I was coming here thinking that... I, I When I came here, I was in a place where I was not sure if I would want to live in L.A. forever. I wasn't sure if I would want to work in film forever. And so I was starting to feel like, should I even be doing it now if I don't think I'm going to be doing it in the future? You know, blah, blah, blah. And thinking maybe I could be happier doing something else or maybe I could be more useful to the world, putting my energy into some other direction. And I came here and I thought that I was going to like want to stay forever uh, and or, or at least feel like, okay, maybe, yeah, maybe I need to try something different than LA. And pretty quickly, I started to really miss living in LA and working in a creative field. And so it's actually rather than throwing me into a life crisis like I thought it might do, it's been a really affirming experience of like, Yeah, I'm here right now and I'm really enjoying this time to do something different, but I think that I want to go go back and stay on the path that I was on, which is really kind of the best possible outcome, I think. So that was very different. And then also, I think because I'm not around people that are all working in film or other creative stuff, and because I'm not doing anything creative while I'm here, like there's no pressure to, to be doing creative things to make a living it's just allowed me to kind of like open up my brain in a different kind of way. So it's been sort of like a very early career sabbatical where I've just been like reading a lot and taking in a lot of art and processing my own thoughts about like where I want to go as an artist, you know, in my future and all of that kind of stuff. So it's it's been really very refreshing in a way that I wasn't necessarily expecting to get out of this. So it's it's kind of been a best case scenario in a lot of ways. And then smaller things that I didn't think about, like the fact that I have, I'm, I'm almost never alone. I've been alone like so little in the last two months since I got here because I share a bedroom. And Ooh. even even when Alex is not around, I live in a house with a family of a mom and dad and a 13 year old boy and then also an Erasmus student from France. So even if my room, if even if I have the room to myself, I very rarely have the whole apartment to myself and I don't drive a car here. So I'm always in public transportation with a million other people or walking down the street with a million other people. So I'm just never alone. You, 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 <laughs> wow. So you never have intimacy somehow. No. And I didn't like, it, it's something that kind of only occurred to me very recently and it was a funny I was trying to explain it to my boyfriend and, and he kind of pointed out how funny the situation was the fifth grade class that I go to on Fridays had you know been really well behaved or whatever and so their prize was that they got to do a talent show and I was watching them do their little talent show and this group of girls was singing Chandelier by Sia uh, and it was <laughs> cringy um, <laughs> but their class was like so impressed It was really, it was painful, but cute. They were all like, oh my gosh, they're so good. And they were like, so not. <laughs> and I was, I was like, oh gosh, like Raul is, he's my favorite teacher at school. I love Raul, the fifth grade teacher. And I was like, oh, he's totally going to make me do something, isn't he? And I, I was very unprepared for this. I'm only in their class one time a week. And so I was thinking about it. And I always, when I'm alone, I just sing a lot. I'm not okay. a good singer, but I was like, okay, I think I, given what I just saw, I think I'm good enough to like 
impress these fifth graders, you know? Okay. <laughs> and then I realized, like, oh, I don't know the last time that I've sang. Which, again, to reiterate, not good. That's why I only sing when I'm alone. And I was like, oh my god, I'm never alone. Ever. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as I realized that, I felt, like, trapped a little bit. Oh, um, <laughs> wow. Well, and I shared a room for all four years of college, and I never minded it, and I don't mind it now at all. Like, Alex has been a great roommate, and there's enough time that I have my bedroom to myself, but it's a bedroom in a home that belongs to a family. So it's not like, even though they're very welcoming and are like, like we use the kitchen, obviously, yeah. and they're very much like, oh, you can sit in the living room and watch TV or whatever. It's sort of like... It's their space. I don't really want to feel like I'm intruding on the way. Yeah, they no, live their you life. just have the bedroom. Yeah, so like as as nice as they've been, it really feels like I just have the bedroom. There well, you I have can the cook there. Myself. Oh no yeah, cooking there. Oh yeah, yeah, I cook there. Yeah, and they're like the mom especially is like so nice, and they only speak Spanish, which has been great for us because I talk to. Her name is Monica. She's my my fake mom. I talk to her like every day, and it's a, a forced way to speak Spanish, um, and practice with that. And like it's it's really a lovely situation, and it's a lot less expensive than a lot of my friends pay. But yeah, it's just it's very much not mine, and I'm realizing like whoa, I think I took for granted the fact that like even in college when I was sharing a bedroom, it was I was living with friends. I was like equal. Yeah, I had equal stake in the house, you know, and it was the type of thing where, like, for example, if I cooked something and the pan needed to soak afterwards, like, it wasn't coming clean, I could fill it with water and then go to class for three hours and then come back and wash yeah. it and it was fine. But when you live with a family, family and it's not your family, you don't want to do that, you know, so, so it's you're like... you really clean, clean. Yeah. Does the, is it like a life lesson, almost? It's... It, in a way, yeah, there's certain things that it's lesson. It's a lesson in different ways. Like for one thing, I think I've been cleaner than I normally am. I'm mean, I'm a pretty clean person always, but like you know, I want to be respectful of her. So it's like no leaving my clothes on the floor. I'm just gonna put put them away right away, or like I clean up right away. You Whoa. know, it's very much like that. And at the same time, it's a lesson about myself and like I, certain things. Like I didn't realize how much my car is like a, a safe place for me like that's if i'm i drive well, so much in la yeah but that's alone. that's that's la yeah well and that's the u.s per se yeah the car mm. but it's just, like i think a lot of times i think of driving as a hassle i don't hate driving a lot of people hate driving i actually really enjoy driving and so i'm like i'm when people talk about self-driving cars i'm like please don't Like I, I would want to keep driving, but but I I think what I didn't really realize was that that is like that's my time, you know, <laughs> and yeah. I can choose to like a lot of times I call my parents when I'm driving or whatever. Like my mom, oh yeah, that's true. My mom jokes that like she's glad that there's a lot of traffic in LA or we would never talk. <laughs> I the, like sometimes I talk to my parents or sometimes. I'm like, nope, and I will listen to a podcast, or I listen to music, and sometimes even that, I'm like, nope, and I will sit in silence in my car for an hour and just, like, be by myself. <laughs> so is, is, like, the two hours bus the equivalent of your traffic jam in LA? Um, I mean, it depends where you're going, but, like, when I was working at Sony, that was way across town. Um, I live on the east side in Silver Lake, and my job was on the west side in Culver City, And Which distance is it uh, approximately? I have no idea. I, <laughs> I in LA, it's, it's like a specific to LA thing. I don't measure anything in distance because distance is like not relevant to okay. how long it takes to get somewhere. Also, funny information is that uh, today was the uh, LA marathon. Huh. One of my friends from college was in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the fastest person to run a marathon while dressed as a fast food item. He did, I'm pretty sure it was the LA Marathon uh, in a French fry costume. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, what's, what's your neighborhood? What's the name? Silver Lake. Okay. Home to work was a distance of 14 miles. Like, when you think about it, that doesn't seem too much, but in Los Angeles... Yeah, but even that, it was it was about 40 minutes going there and about an hour coming back. Yeah. And now I'm two hours each way, so... Yeah, and you can't really commute in, in LA. Um, oh, like on transit? Yeah. I happen to be lucky enough to live right across the street from the metro, which is rare in LA. 
but to take it to Culver City was kind of, it adds a lot of time. To take it downtown, it sometimes is faster than driving, so that's nice. So um, I want to get back to living in the, in Los Angeles. I got that experience in El Coyote, as I told you. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, that, that restaurant uh, that you can see in the movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood mm-hmm. because it's actually significant in the history because it's the last uh, last meal from Sharon Tate. <laughs> Gosh, that movie it gave me the chills. Yeah. I loved it. I thought it was a good one. I'm not a huge Tarantino person generally, but I really loved What's Potter Hollywood. They killed Hitler in a Inglorious Bastard. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing. My my friend, that French Canadian guy, you know, like now he's a he's some kind of anarchist pop singer. Oh. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's he's really something interesting now. Anyway, we were in the 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 the, the theater, and it was like I guess two or three weeks that the movie was projected, so it was like still in the prime of the of the of the lifespan of the movie. So I guess that there were like I don't know at least a hundred people in the in the theater, and at the moment. You know they're they are killing Hitler. He just jumped on his seat and it's like they're killing Hitler. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was so genuine and it was like and no one reacted it. You know it was like a yeah, normal thing to do. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Have you seen Jojo Rabbit? No, Speaking not yet. Hitler? Not yet. It's about to be gone. You've got to see it. Yeah, I I love me some Sam Rockwell. Yeah, oh, he's so good in it. He's good in everything. Uh-huh. Even in Charlie's Angels, he's good. <laughs> he's, he's like the only things to say from that horrible movie. I feel like oh. people don't talk about Sam Rockwell. And, and, and they so shouldn't. Good. Let's let's keep <laughs> let's keep our Rocky Rock for, for, for... Oh my God. He's good in everything. What was that, that movie recently that came back through my mind? But it, Welcome to Collinwood. I think I saw that. I was thinking about him in Three Billboards. He's so good in that. I need to watch that. Oh, that was possibly one of my favorite movies. I need to rewatch it, but I loved it when it came out. Okay, so welcome to Collinwood. It's a comedy from the Russo's brother. So way before the the the, the all the Marvel-y stuff, mm-hmm. two thousand two, starting William William H Massey. I I like me some Fargo, so it's it's got me <laughs> Sam Rockwell, Louis Guzman. But yeah, Sam Rockwell in that movie, five star. He's it's like a, not even like he's he's never even the lead in things. He's so underappreciated. Well, I do think that there are some. No, it's not true. Uh, when you think about Confession of a Dangerous Man, mm, true. he's the lead and, and he's, he's not good. the lead enough. He should be the lead. And more. there is that moon. It's that sci fi indie movie where he's alone. Mm. With No, you don't know about no. it? Alright, so we got already two movies to recommend. Nonetheless, I petitioned to cast Sam Rockwell as a leading man oh, yeah. more often. Actually, for the pop culture, is mostly known as the. Bad guy in Iron Man 2. So, basically, the plot is... So, at the end of the first one, Tony Stark says, I'm Iron Man. That's that's the end of it. He's, the, he's like, so badass. He goes public with that. So, now, there is... In the second one, there is Tony Stark, director of the Stark Company. And he has a rival. This is Sam Rockwell. And he's that uh, guy that, that sells the weapon. And he, there is that battle... The, between them, commercial battle. They, they clearly Sam Rockwell want to prove that he's better than Starks or whatever. Sam Rockwell ends up teaming up with the bad guy of the movie, which is uh, <laughs> Mikey Rourke. I don't know how to uh-huh. say his name. And he's the bad guy, and he's, he's kind of ridiculous bad guy. Uh, but uh, Sam, Sam Rockwell is still the, the good part. Uh, of the the movie, even though it's not really his best. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, I'm recommending uh, Collinwood and uh, Moon. That would be nice to know why you ended up working on movie set. How like how do you evolve in your life <laughs> from a, a little girl from Wisconsin to a young woman uh, in 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 LA working on movie set? Yeah, um, it was a gradual evolution of a long and incremental process so my two childhood best friends now 
both also work in film, one in LA and one in Chicago. Um, and we started out making little silly movies together when we were kids um, that were actually pretty well done for the lack of resources and the lack of age. Um, but they're very ridiculous and they're things that we've like sworn to never show anybody again. And so that was always something we did for fun. Then when I got to high school, uh, we had this, we had a film teacher. And so there were four years worth of film classes that you could take at my public high school, which was very cool. And a lot of people took them for fun. So my freshman year, I signed up for that to be my one like fun class because I was a very like, I, I was a very academic person. I took a lot of AP classes and all of that. So my one fun class would be my film class. So I was in this film class um, and... The, my teacher told me about a screenwriting competition for uh, youth in our area, um, through, I guess in southeastern Wisconsin, and it was a really amazing program where you kind of, basically there were rounds of elimination and stuff, and kind of, the first round was that you got to do all of this full day of workshops with local professionals who worked in the film industry in Milwaukee, which is mostly uh, driven by commercial work, and then people's like sort of passion projects and stuff but there are a good amount of people that do work full-time in film in Milwaukee so all these people had agreed to come in and do this workshop and teach 50 of us how to actually write a screenplay and how to format it and how to fledge out your flesh out your ideas and everything and then you submitted a, a full script and next round uh 15 people were chosen to get this one-on-one -on -one mentorship with somebody one of the professionals and then um, finally they chose one script to be professionally produced at no cost to you, of course. Um, and then five people who had kind of had the, the next best scripts essentially got to come on board and work on the winning film and as basically as like interns. So I did that project or that competition for three years in a row and I got first to the first stage and then to the second stage and then uh, in my third year, which was the final year of the program, my film was chosen and it was wow. really, really cool. Um, well, congratulations. <laughs> thank and you. I mean, it's, it's a very it's long not, time ago, but thank you. <laughs> it's, no, but I mean, I mean, in a sense that there is such, from an early age, a recognition from the quality of your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and, and it was just an amazing experience to get to have this mentorship. Um, and also because I did the program three years in a row, I, I got to kind of know some of these people. And from the second year, um, especially when I had worked on the winning film, um, and the way you did it, they, they did it was that you rotated for half a day through each department. And I just really liked the art department. That was what was the most interesting to me and also what I felt I was the best suited for. Um, and then the script that I wrote that ended up being chosen was kind of without even trying very like the production design played a, a very key role in the story. And so then when we were making that, um, I helped a lot with the art department again. Uh, and after that, I was, I guess, I, th I think I was 16 or 17 when we were making that. And after that, people from that shoot asked me to um, assist on their films, basically. So as from the time that I... Or before I went to college, I had worked on a couple of short films, a feature film starring Sean Astin from The Lord of the Rings. Nice! Uh, <laughs> that was shot in Milwaukee. And a couple commercials. What, 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 what's the name of the movie? Uh, it's a shitty movie that didn't actually get theatrical release. I don't yeah, think, but I, I want to know it's, anyway. It's called The Surface. Uh, but have you have you seen the 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 poster? Yeah. They present it as the new 2012. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They they present it as a as an action <laughs> movie. Is it an action movie? No, but there was a helicopter for one scene. Yeah, that was a really crazy experience because it was the writer slash producer was kind of weird dude and then it was half it was like all of the department heads were shipped out from la 4.7 on imdb yeah i'm sure it's not good the department heads were shipped out from la and they were all kind of assholes and they really did not mix well with the milwaukee crew and like milwaukee crew is we have some solid people working in milwaukee but they have a system and you just gotta trust it 
It was cool getting to shoot out on the lake. There's a lot of stuff you don't think about with logistically shooting on water. They really do sell it as an action movie. I don't remember it being that way. I'm not sure it's a good movie. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not a good movie. Nobody would tell you that it is who worked on it. But it was a really awesome experience. I yeah. was super glad to be a part of it. So what did you do on that movie? I was the I, I was sort of straddling the art department and the wardrobe department. So I was the art and wardrobe PA. And I was there for... I think I was there like three days a week or something, um, which is unusual. But because I was in high school and had another job and, you know, whatever, uh, was getting paid a flat rate for the five weeks. They just... And it's Milwaukee and nothing was official. So they just had me come in three days a week. And then... How old were you? 17, I think. And wow. then from there, I got my first job PAing on a commercial um, with this out of town crew, and I worked with them on three or four different commercials in Milwaukee. And I didn't tell them that I was underage when they hired me, which is the only reason that they ever did hire me. Um. <laughs> well, you know, we, we've all been through that, I guess. <laughs> Getting the first job is, I guess, a challenge all the time. Yeah. My first job, I did not tell them how young I was, and nobody knew. Uh, you can work when you're 14 in, in the U.S., wow. but they, for films specifically, it would have just been a lot of extra liability for them. Like, it's not common to work on film sets until you're 18. I guess that the only other way to start to be so young on a cast of a movie is to actually be part of the cast. Yeah, um, or to have parents that are connected. Or, or yeah, no. exactly, the son of someone or the daughter of someone. Yeah, and in LA, that I that wouldn't have been possible unless I was somebody's daughter. But yeah. in Milwaukee, it was just... I, I was really lucky. Milwaukee is... I will defend that city forever. I love it. And I think that uh, one thing that's really cool and unique about it is that, like, the... Art scene in general there is very small, but it's very, like, strong and well-supported. You know, people go to the theater and the ballet and the orchestra and the film festival, and, like, it's something that people, I think, are really proud of about the city. And and every, they're just, it's a lot of nice people. So people were really welcoming to say, like, oh, you have an interest in this? Sure, you know, come, would you like to come be a part of this set or that set? And so I got a lot of experience with it before... I went to college, which is kind of, you know, maybe the only way that I would have applied to film school was to have already been on a set and say, like, yeah, I think I'm pretty confident that this is what I want to do with my life. Because otherwise, I think that would have been such a shot in the dark, you know, to yeah. be like, I've never actually been on a set, but it sounds fun. Maybe I could do that forever. I'll just move across the country and give it a shot, you know, at 18 so it, years old. <laughs> wow. So it was really like to to have had that experience was the only way that I could have seen myself actually doing it. And I I made the decision and I applied to a bunch of film schools and I ended up going to USC, which is by this metric that's completely bullshit anyways, is the best film school in the world um, and moved to L.A. and I've been there ever since. <laughs> wow. It's, uh, it's an another of those times when there would be the... Wow! <laughs> so, yeah, LA. Well, I get a reference. I get actually two references to LA mm -hmm. in, my, in my apartment. I get my hat with the California Republic. Uh -huh. It's in California, right? Sure, and, sure. <laughs> and uh, I get that lamp uh -huh. right there with the Hollywood sign. Yeah, on. I and first noticed that lamp that says visit Los Angeles as you were telling me how you didn't enjoy visiting Los Angeles. <laughs> But I do think that <laughs> this Los Angeles is more interesting than the Los Angeles they sell you. Uh -huh. Like, this is a Los Angeles by night, in a car, you know, on the height of Los Angeles. Uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the movie Drive. Oh, yeah. I like that movie. I, Drive is actually my favorite movie. Oh, really? So, for the longest time, it was Traffic mm -hmm. by Steven Soderbergh. It's a, it's a movie that I uh, saw exactly at the right age for it to hit me really in the guts. Mm -hmm. um, so Steven Soderbergh was already a big thing because he started his career really early with uh, and with a really, really famous movie like... Um, Sex, Lies and Video. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
then uh, he, he did he did a lot of stuff. Uh, I mean, after traffic, he did uh, many things like the Ocean Eleven, like the Che Guevara, like you know. This well, he Victoria. also is insane because he edits and shoots his own movies under fake names. Really? Yeah, he uses his parents' names, and not all of them, but a lot of them he he shoots and edits as well as directing. And he writes and he produces. I don't know how. And he like he always publishes a list at the end of the year with everything that he has watched and read throughout the year. And like I truly just don't understand how he has enough hours in the day for the life that he leads. It doesn't so, make any sense. Let's uh, let's start his career. So he started his career with two shorts and and then he does that uh, six lies and videotape. Mm-hmm. And then he did okay. He did out of sight, like one of the best movie ever made. Have you ever watched that? No. It's... Okay, I'm gonna make a big jump there, a big assumption. But I think that's George Clooney as its sexiest and Jennifer Lopez oh. as her sexiest. Wow. And you get those... That's a bold statement. And you get some two extremely beautiful people flirting in a cat and mouse game mm-hmm. during the movie. Mm-hmm. So you just watch it for the beautiful people. It's really smart. Uh, it's actiony if you like some actions. It's well acted. The story is bonkers. I, I think that the story, yeah, it's from a uh, and more Leonard novel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everything's good. It's seven on ten on IMDb. For me, it's a nine out of ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's literally there. Then then he did uh, the Limey. It's it's another really really nice movie. Uh, then and then he did that fucking Grand Slam three movie. I I think you know in some career there are like some moments where like the director produced three freaking amazing movies, and that's that's the perfect example. Mm-hmm. So in the same year, Erin Brockovich Traffic, and in the next year, o- Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> That's really crazy. That's like... <laughs> That's just such a tight timeline to be doing free movies of any quality. And and those are like the three, maybe, yeah, probably the three best movies mm-hmm. you made. I mean, I mean... So, I don't know, Magic Mike. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna throw that one in the mix. <laughs> Um, I okay as a as a guilty pleasure. Ocean's Twelve, <laughs> <laughs> really, I I like it. So okay, as a uh, guilty but, pleasure. But Ocean's Magic Twelve Mike. was two thousand four. Okay, the informant is good. The informant is amazing, but it's two thousand nine, so it's still ten years ago. Okay, another guilty pleasure, but totally another style. A wire. It's a former UFC fighter, Gina Carano. Super famous now because of that The Mandalorian TV show. Okay. She's really, really... She has like one of the second or third role in that TV show. She's uh, she's big. And she uh, <laughs> she's uh, some kind of secret agent. And uh, everybody's trying to kill her. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she's killing everyone. It's like it's basically the movie. <laughs> uh-huh. And it's good. It's entertaining <laughs> as fuck. And if you liked yeah, Magic Mike, good. you you will like Haywire. Oh, and I get to watch Logan Lucky. Oh, it's on Netflix. Oh, I haven't watched that either. That's supposed to be really good. Yeah. That was his um, basically experiment with film marketing to see. He tried to do like some guerrilla marketing kind of stuff and bank on Channing Tatum's Instagram following. For a lot of their marketing, um, and did all this like influencer type Instagram marketing, cut the marketing budget to like half of what it would normally be for a movie of that scale. And it was basically his experiment to see like now that we're in the year that we're in, whatever, two thousand eighteen or whatever that was, like will this work? Will this be a successful strategy? And the answer was no, because that movie was not seen by very many people, despite it being yeah. a, a, allegedly fantastic and also having. Uh, Adam Driver, Channing Tatum, and who's the third person? Daniel Craig? Yeah. Yeah. It's like such a powerful cast and a movie that had a, a good rep and there that is, no one saw it. <laughs> and yeah, oh my god, there is like super, really nice uh, supporting cast. There is uh, Katie Holmes? <laughs> I'm still I'm still in love with Kitty Holmes from Dawson Creek because <laughs> it was right my age I was a teenager and there was Joy Potter everyone was crazy of her <laughs> uh, so there is a guy from Parks and Rex and there is a guy from The Office Seth MacFarlane yeah that's uh, that's I mean I just see the cast and and I love it 
And I saw the movie, I watched the movie Traffic at the perfect age, I guess it came out in France in 2001. I was slightly unprepared, but I was 15. So it really hit the exact right note. I feel like it was the same experience for me and the Fellowship of the Ring. I know that it's not the best movie or whatever, but I was like 17 when I when I saw it. Mm-hmm. And it was opening so many doors to me that I didn't even imagine before in terms of imagination and in terms of what cinema could do for the audience. Mm -hmm. Because I had that kind of feelings previously with um, Towers. It has something really unique Mm -hmm. until it was brought to Disney. But (laughs) I mean, (laughs) we will see the future. we've had too much Star Wars by a long shot. We will see in the future how everything holds up all together, but... I think maybe that, like, perfect alternate world for me was Harry Potter mm. as a kid. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. So what do you think about those uh, that Grimwald movie? The Crimes of yeah. Grindelwald. It, well, I think they just did what Star Wars did, which was that they had this weird revival of the IP to try to make more money, and it's not as good as the original and never will be. <laughs> but there must be a third movie, right? Yeah. There will be, I think. Yeah. Why did they introduce to us to a bad character literally almost as powerful as Voldemort, Voldemort or even more, actually? I literally don't even think that it's, like, something that can really be analyzed because I think it was such a pure money grab. Like, I don't think that there's a lot of thought that went into those movies, which is how I feel about the more recent Star Wars as well. Like, I, I think it was just... Any way that they could think to build a story off of this IP, and they didn't have the original storyteller to help them do it, and I don't know who those who the writers were and how you know what other things they've done in the past, but it's just some someone spent you know a good chunk of her life making this world and these characters and everything, and then this studio just bought up the IP and tried to build on that with a different brain. And it's not, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and now we learn that every one of the characters was actually homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, they would do it if it would sell, I think. Well, that's, uh, I, I think that uh, already J.K. Rowling was making, like, a lot of uh, questioning about uh, the Dumblebee, Dumbledore guy. <laughs> Blah blah blah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Dumbledore guy would be gay or not? I don't know. And now we know. Oh, you you didn't watch the la- the, the the No, I watched. Oh. I watched the first. Fuck one you! Of I, those. Did I just spoil the movie for you? Don't worry, I'm never gonna watch. Okay. It. Uh. Well, he he had a story with the bad guy. Uh, I watched the first Fantastic Beasts. That's what it's called. But no. Well, yeah, Dumb- Dumbledore has a story with Johnny Depp. Mm-hmm. Jed Lowe and Johnny Depp all together. <laughs> yeah, no, Johnny Depp, I think, is a bit too late. Yeah. He's like a good 10, 15 years too old. Yeah, Johnny Depp is what the fuck ha- What the fuck happened to Johnny Depp? He was the shit for so many years. Yeah, I mean, he got old and a little bit crazy. <laughs> I really loved him in uh, Sleepy Hollow, mm-hmm. Donny Brasco... Or oh, even in the pi- first Pirate of the Caribbean. Yeah, I mean, that's that's like the Johnny Depp role, I think, is Pirates of the Caribbean. That's like probably what he's most, you know, attached to in people's minds. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But it's also the climax of Johnny Depp. So after that, it's like the downfall. Yeah, yeah, he fell off after Pirates. But Pirates also went on for a really long time. No, they but I mean, I mean, those. I mean, I'm talking about the first part. Pirate, mm-hmm. like not the others. The other are like big pile of money grab being because yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that that went bad, really bad, real fast. <laughs> <coughs> it's like uh, it's like the <coughs> it's like any oh and it, exactly what we're talking about. They just learned all the wrong lessons from the the first movie that worked. You know, yeah. Uh, in the first movie, what what worked was like it was a lot of fun. And it was, you know, uh, a different, lot of new things that you wouldn't see in Pirates movie. I don't know. Uh, it, it was like something different and, you know, alternative. Almost like there are some points of an indie movie because like 
it was not like the usual blockbuster stuff, stuff like that. And you, you had zero expectation because you were literally going to watch a movie that is inspired from a fucking, uh, animatronic, you know, in a theme park. But for the second and third, it's like the only thing they, the, 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 the producers were in mind is like, oh, there was a lot of explosions, so we need to put a lot of explosions in yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, what Marvel is, too, I feel like. It's just, like, these <laughs> these big movies. Or it's like, oh, Johnny Depp is in here, and people like to do Johnny Depp, so we'll put, like, Johnny Depp's uh, <laughs> sleeping, Johnny Depp's drinking, Johnny Depp's, like, yeah, Johnny Depp is li- literally fucking drunk all the fucking time in those movies, and and that's too much. My friend, the one who initially asked me to come to Spain and then backed out, my, like, favorite fact about her is that she had Pirates of the Caribbean 2 stuck in the DVD drive of her computer for, like, five years or something. (laughs) So she just watched it constantly. (laughs) Like, if she was like, I'm kind of bored right now, I got my laptop, she'd just flip over to Pirates. So she's seen that movie, like, a million times. Which I just think is so funny. It's the most random movie. Not even the first one. Pirates of the Caribbean 2. <laughs> Seen it more than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so good. Oh god. Oh god. Oh no. It's like, uh, I don't know. Do I have a movie like that? Like I know that it's really bad, but I love watching it. I don't know. Oh, my, my friend told me that I love him. His name is uh, Jean Hubert. And he, he, the movie that he watched the most in his life was Rambo 2. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so good when someone's most watched movie is a sequel to another movie. <laughs> I love that. Because like already the first Rambo, it's like... It's hardcore. I mean, it's a great movie. Have you ever watched it? No. That's that's uh, that's full recommend once again. But it's really like hardcore movie because it's in the wood and uh, John Rambo is that guy that is uh, like uh, after the war and it, and uh, he arrives in that town and as soon as he arrived in the town, the ch- the sheriff of the city and he's like, you you don't fucking enter the town. But he really wants to just go through the town and. Do go somewhere else, you know, he's just walking around and I guess trying to find some work or, mm-hmm. you know, living, living on the road, right? And he has problems. It, it escalates really quickly. Mm-hmm. And at some point, there is literally him against the, the law enforcement of that city. Mm-hmm. And he goes in the wood and in the end, like, he blows the entire city and it's okay yeah it's funny it's it's vulgar as fuck (laughs) but it it is actually a really good movie because uh you really root for him Mm -hmm. because you feel like okay that guy has seen some shit because it's he's after the war i guess it's the vietnam war at that time and yeah he's uh he's he's all fucked up and when he arrives he's like you know in a marginal and he's rejected and then it was like some special operation or whatsoever. So it's like, you know, okay, don't, don't fuck with John Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what it is. Uh, yeah, good movie, really good movie. But Rambo 2, not a good movie. <laughs> it was, uh, it was one of those movies that I passionately avoided, you know. And I knew that it was bad. John Rambo 2, I was like, no. You know, I, I think I watched the first one. And then the John Rambo, that was like the fourth one. I would never go naturally back to that Rambo 2. And then I, <laughs> I went back to it and I regret it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, it's going to be it uh, for that uh, second episode. Um, how did you like your experience of Brussels? It was great. I really like Brussels. I, for some reason, I've wanted to come to Belgium for like ever. So I'm glad that I did. And yeah, it was... Really good food, really nice just to be able to walk around and kind of explore, and I don't often travel alone, so it was cool to just get to sort of wander and see whatever was there, and um, there's so many museums here. I wish that I could do more of that, honestly, but but I I liked it a lot. It was a very, like, felt like a very classic European city. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Which, like, Madrid in some ways doesn't. 
10 out of 10. I'm happy. <laughs> nice. Nice. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, being my guest. Uh, it was uh, really a pleasure to, uh, to host you. Mm-hmm. And, and thank uh, you for hosting me. Oh my goodness. You've been so generous <laughs> and so nice. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not whatever. Uh, anyway, so uh, that will be all for this week. Uh, thank you, uh, Katie, for, 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 for everything. And uh, how can we find you? How can we find some stuff or like a portfolio or something like that. Um, if people are interested in, in your work. You can find my portfolio on my website, www.katiefield.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't hesitate to share, to comment, to like on SoundCloud, YouTube and, and Instagram. And it's going to be it. And uh, thank you again. This is uh, Antoine Lavati. Welcome to the center of the world. And uh, see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment and check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, Facebook and Instagram. See you next time. noises in the apartment it's like a 90% chance that it's my <laughs> my cat doing something skizzy <laughs> he's cutie but it's uh, he's, he's very cute yeah okay he's cute <laughs> he's like the Don Juan of the the, 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 the cats <laughs> when my friends what? from college he threw it like tabarnak he threw it like oh my god it was like welcome to what And it's a weapon army thingy corporation that do things, you know, and these kind of things. Uh, on Mar, on the 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 the, the, the uh, work, <laughs> on the uh, how do you say that? On the field, in the mm-hmm. field of okay. selling things that kills other people. And this is Mark Wahlberg, and in the end. Uh, Mark Wahlberg, uh, not Mark Wahlberg, oh, Sam Rockwell, fuck, I'm mixing up. I'm okay. Mixing up. Uh, Sam <laughs> Rockwell. thinking about the other What? No. Yeah. No, no, we're not talking about <laughs> Marky Mark. Anyway. Uh, I had to. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, because yesterday night we, we watched some Marky Marky stuff, the other guys, and we had to watch that cinema scenes video about like everything's wrong with the happening. Mm-hmm. And yeah, everything's wrong with the happening. <laughs> and yeah, the acting of Marky Mark is uh, is is really nice in that one. It's so bad. <laughs> That's just been the joke of the weekend. This is lying in there. Oh no! No. Oh no! Yeah. What? No. <laughs> yeah, he has two two horrible moments. Man. Oh, he's he's doing a Marky Mark performance of a bad guy in. <laughs> In a Marvel Universe movie. Because <laughs> he's supposed to be that r- Russian guy. <laughs> But it's like so bad. Uh-huh. So bad. Cringy uh, Mikey. I which is uh, they, which it's, it's like post- Russian. <coughs> Excuse me. Coronavirus. It's, coronavirus. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's hitting us right now. Um... <laughs> Sean Astin was a very nice guy. Oh yes, he is. He's a uh, like a Sam's guy. Yeah. He's, he's... Honestly, now these days I should be saying it's Sean Astin okay. from Stranger Things. I feel like that's what a lot of people know him from. I don't like. I moment. don't like his drama still in Stranger Things. <laughs> okay, so Mitch takes his late father's boat out to the center of Lake Michigan for a final ride in his memory, but collides with the wreckage of a small plane in the water? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the plot second. <laughs> Kelly, the pilot who survived the crash but severely injured, is pulled onto Mitch's boat for rescue. However, the debris of the wreckage had knocked the propeller of the boat's motor, leaving both men stranded in the middle of the lake okay 
that's 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 it. Yeah, it's just uh, it's, they're stuck out on this lake, and the one guy went out there to kill himself, and then the other guy's dying, and then they reckon, they, you know, they talk about life, they reconcile things. He decides not to kill himself. We have some solid. <clears throat> Goodness, my voice keeps cracking. Um, <laughs> we've been talking too long. King of the Hill. Why not about it? King of the Hill, the TV show. A young boy struggles in on okay, his no, own. Okay, not the TV show. Well, yeah, but oh, wait. Seven point five on IMDb. I'm thinking, wow, this is a crazy mistake. I'm thinking King of Queens, which is a no, 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 no. stupid sitcom. A young boy struggles on his own in a rundown motel after his parents and young brother are separated from him in the 30s Depression era Midwest. Midwest. Ew. Okay. That's how it's always portrayed, though. Like, the 30s Depression era Midwest. It's always, like, well, a that's, sad place. That's most... That's probably one of the the next uh, movie I'm gonna watch. It has oh my god, it has no one famous. Oh, it has Adrian Brody. Interesting. But it must be young Adrian Brody because it's from '93. Yeah. So it's like teenager it's Adrian young. Brody. Um. Then he did the underneath. Oh, that's a bigger cast. A recovering gambling addict attempts to reconcile with his family and friends but finds trouble and temptation when caught between feelings for his ex-wife and her dangerous hoodlum boyfriend. What's a hoodlum? Um, like a, a delinquent. Oh. <laughs> Fuck off. Kana, Gina, wait, let me check that. <laughs> Gina Carano, yeah. Uh, and then and, and fucking, fucking, fucking uh, James Bond. Uh, Daniel Craig? Yeah, there is the guy from Parks and Rex, you know? The guy that they are always making fun of. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds sexy. Okay, I, we got, I get to take care of business because my cat is, is trying to clean <laughs> Katie's car and it's not good. Oh my okay. goodness. Oh, right. So That's just gonna be the outtakes. <laughs> All that will be the outtakes, you know, that what we put after the end of uh-huh. the episode. We're producing outtakes right now. <laughs> we got some snacks. It's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be horrible for the sound because we will hear us <laughs> eating. You're an old man. And I was out of huh? You're an old man. Why? Why do you say so? I was five. <laughs> I was watching traffic. <laughs> <laughs> My parents I was were showing trying me. not to run into traffic. I don't want to run in that movie. <laughs> unprepared. About what? <laughs> we totally can hear the cat sitting. Um, it's like I guess it's some kind of hippie somehow. You know, he's a fucking oh, hippie. hippie. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he fucked them up. <laughs> so um I always watch some movie. Uh this is something that I didn't really assess yet. Uh, that I really, really, really love movies. Uh, <laughs> I watched it maybe over three thousand movies. I, I wanna write movies. When it's in the jungle, because there was like at some point and there is that un- un- humanitarian team doing stuff and in the end he's just chopping enemies arms and killing them with a huge machine gun it's like there is a scene it's like it's painful because he's you know he's in that jeep and he has the machine gun and all the enemy are on the other side of the mountain but there is like maybe 15 of them and you see him killing them one by one with the machine gun it's like (laughs) Uh it's like what the fuck yeah, action movies like that. It's are like not, not America, fuck yeah! Uh-huh. <laughs> I like it when it's South Park doing it, not when it's like. Uh, you really have. Whatever. It's been, it's been very I, lovely. Okay.